Yeah. But the one about the different, you know, the different inches that you got to stand when you're speaking. I did. I I'm sorry. You know what I mean? The different inches that you, when you're speaking, that you got to stand. I like that. So who wants to talk about the first chapter? Are you listening? Some of the nonverbal communication? Not nonverbal communication, um, the listening. I thought it was interesting that, you know, I always thought that listening was kind of like an innate characteristic, something we were born with, some, uh, an ability that we just naturally did. Barbara is violently shaking her head. No way. You can be a good listener, a bad listener, but you can also learn to be a good listener. So, absolutely. And that's what this chapter says. So, where were you at? Chapter 11. We're okay. talking about the chapter is called Are You Listening? <laughs> so, you were supposed to read it. Um, okay. I want to take, so there's a listening self assessment. Yes. So, let's go over that real quick. Okay. Page 133. Hi, Bella. How are you? Let me read that out. Now, I don't want everyone to read it out loud. I want you guys to just take out a piece of paper or open a Word document and just answer each question. So just write one, two, three. Don't write out the question. Just write your answer to the question. Excuse me, Emily. I'm sorry. I did it on um, page 11. I didn't read chapter 11. I read 11 and 13. It's okay if you didn't read it. Do the quiz. Yeah, even if she didn't get a chance to read it, you should be able to do the quiz. Emily, uh, be on the quiz. Yeah. Here. The pen. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, there's, you gotta, we got to wait. So, we have to get Chris first. Yeah. Let's see how Chris works. This computer because there's jobs on it. That is a lot of computer. That computer is good tonight. It's side on. Can you use that one? Yeah. 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 Yes, I'm just
So did I finish it yet? One slowly and you often speak more than half of the time in the discussion between you and one other person. Is that right? Okay. So who has four or more yeses? Raise your hands. I have four yeses. Four yeses? So raise your hand and keep it up. I only see one hand up. But you have one. Yeah. So raise your hand. Just didn't need a swipe in. Oh. You don't need no, raise your hand. Anyone else? No one else had four or more yeses? That is good. You guys are all good listeners. So which one do you have issues with? Textbook, workbook. Textbook, workbook. 
What? Did they have to say these? No. No, nope, it was just a just quick question. It was just an exercise to talk about everyone's listening ability. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that listening is not automatic, like Barbara said, and that it's something that's learned. So, I mean, and all of you now apparently have great listening skills. So that's good. That's a strength. Because it is. I mean, think of it in the business context. Think of it when you're interviewing, like, or looking for a job. During the interview, you typically engage in a dialogue with the recruiter or the person who's interviewing you, right? We're not. Um, but one of the things that is true is you're going to have a conversation with the person who's interviewing you, right? Yes. When you send that thank you follow-up email, do you want to point out some of those, you know, discussions you've had, some of those chances where you've had a great chance to kind of hear the recruiter know a little bit more about them? So if you're a good listener, which again, all of you are, then that's a great opportunity for you to excel. I have to take notes when I'm in interviews, you know, to make sure that I, re or if I want to email someone or point something out, I take notes. And I'm not saying you guys shouldn't take notes because notes are so important. But, you know, the fact that you have good listening skills is really, it's, it's helpful for your interviewing. Okay? Um, so there's something that's pointed out, one second, that Dale pointed out, the lack of interest. So these are listening distractions, which is on 135. There's a lot of things that can go on during um, when you guys are trying to listen that might distract you, right? Yeah. You could have something going on at home in your personal life. There could be background noise. There could be people going in and out of the room. People chattering. Yeah, people chattering. Like Chris is going in and out of the room and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> but, I, you know, like there could be lots of things that distract you. We have to work to overcome these. Um, and especially in BBC when we're trying to present our best self and present as strongly as possible. Good listening requires that you focus on the other person, including the person's feelings, opinions, and needs. Some poor listeners hear only enough to know what part is all about me, me, me. Okay, so you want to try and focus on the other person as much as possible. So the importance of active listening, it's on your workbook pages 9 to 12. Does someone have that open that they can kind of review it? 9 to 12? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Where is it? Page 9. Tabletop or table? No, right? Yes. No, not table topics. The importance of active listening. Oh, okay. What page? It says 9 to 12, but... I don't know who puts these books together. Not me. I didn't put these books together. That's the wrong one, though. All right, well, let's just all look for the importance of active listening. Come on. See ya. Can you email me there? Yeah. What's the name to show me how to get it? Yeah, we I showed you what did they show you? It's not in there, guys? No. Do you have it? No. So no one has it in their book? No. No, it's not tabletop. That's what I have. Yes. Close to the topic. I have quotes. Okay. Alright. All right. So let's just skip the importance of active listening because we are not finding it today. Um, Is it it's book? in the book, so it's kind of what we went over. Dale, what page do you see it in the book? Listening. So there's a listening. Are you listening? Chapter 11. Chapter 11. Yeah. We got it in our... So now we've got it. 
textbook, page chapter 11. Chapter 11 in the textbook. Yeah, but we don't. Yeah. Are you listening? All right, let's just skip that. Let's just go on to table topics. <gasps> so, page nine in the book. Okay, so turn to table topics, which it sounds like most of you have got. You talking about the folder or you talking about this book? In the folder. Okay. So what are table topics, Carolyn? Table topics are quotes. No. Well, I have page nine. It says table topics and then. So quotes. It says here. Yes, it does. So those are some quotes. So table topics um, are where you're going to get up. We're going to start not today, not even next class, but we're going to start each class not with a quote, but with a table topic. Now the examples that they have for table topics, it looks like, um, are quotes. So that's don't let that confuse you. This is the right page. Basically, it is. So basically, you're going to have a topic. The way they have this spread out is different quotes. So the quote for the day could be the topic. So, Carolyn, what's the first quote? The first quote is, the actor W.C. Fields once said, I never vote for, my, for anyone. I always vote against. Do you think many Americans feel this way when they vote? So that's a great topic that relates, I think, to what Dale talked about earlier, right? Yeah. So if, if that were today's table topic, then we would go around to each person. Stan, do you remember if it's 30 seconds or two minutes that they have to talk about? 30 seconds. 30 so seconds. each person has 30 seconds to talk I'm sorry, about wait, 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 wait. the I'm topic lying. at the I'm end. I'm lying. I'm lying. It's not the seconds. It is two minutes. I'm sorry. It's two minutes. Yes. Okay. So each person will have a designated amount of time to talk about a certain topic. Obviously, you're not going to be able to prepare for the topic. I think. It's going to be something random. These are some possible topics. We also often might just make a list of possible topics on the board and then go around and you know brainstorm and then we'll talk about personally if there's one or each person can choose their own. But you want to get used to this an exercise that helps build confidence. Uh, has anyone ever heard Toastmasters? I was just getting ready to raise my hand. Okay, so Jeff, tell us about it though. Toastmasters is like a public learning to speak um, directly and good, and they do table topics. And what they did in table topics when I was there last, um, they gave me and two other people um, a topic and we had to expand on it. And like I said, it's about two minutes long. And you had to be distinctive and clearly and clear, and you may not say um, and you just can't be um like I just did. <laughs> so we'll have a person who is responsible. And they time you, they the time clock. you, and they say after it's all over to tell you how many times you did say um, yeah. and actually, and they'll pick the person who did the best thing that so was going really fun. And we'll have a person count the number of um. Mm -hmm. That's how much that. Exactly. So it's to help get people get used to public speaking. Which is really good. Get cool. used to accepting the speaking. So it's speaking about a topic you're not prepared for, right? Speaking about right. something kind of off the cuff. It's just, it's freelancing. It's just yeah, it's freelancing. It's figuring out freestyling, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> figuring it out um, you know. as you go. So that's what we're going to get to later. It's not going to be in this class or in the next class, but it is something we're going to start doing regularly in class. Tim's I think it's a that that's in the book. It's between pages 9 and 12. Those are different table topics that you can choose from. Like <coughs> politics, law, sports, leisure, to enjoyment, prom questions, city, state issues, spiritual, business, in the academy. And some people have that on the They're out for the place. Of course, our question.
Can you turn that light back on, please? Somebody, please. Just a moment. offering you a free no tech life hack um, and all it requires of you is this that you change your posture for two minutes but before I give it away I want to ask you to right now do a little audit of your body and what you're doing with your body so how many of you are sort of making yourself smaller maybe you're hunching um, crossing your legs maybe wrapping your ankles sometimes we hold on to our arms like this uh, Sometimes we uh, spread out. I see you. Um, so I want you to pay attention to what you're doing right now. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. And I'm hoping that if you sort of learn to tweak this a little bit, it could significantly change the way your life unfolds. Um, so we're really fascinated with body language. And we're particularly interested in other people's body language. You know, we're interested in, like, you know, um, a, uh, uh, an awkward interaction or a smile or a contemptuous glance or maybe a, a very awkward wink um, or maybe even something like a handshake. Here they are arriving at number 10 and uh, look at this lucky policeman gets to shake hands with the President of the United States. Oh and here comes the Prime Minister of the... Mm. No. <laughs> A handshake or the lack of a handshake can have us talking 
for weeks and weeks and weeks, even the BBC and the New York Times. So, so obviously, when we think about nonverbal behavior or body language, but we call it nonverbals as social scientists, it's language. So we think about communication. When we think about communication, we think about interactions. So what is your body language communicating to me? What's mine communicating to you? And there's a lot of reason to, be to, to believe that this is, this is a valid way to look at this. So social scientists have spent a lot of time looking at the effects of, of our body language or other people's body language on judgments. And we make sweeping judgments and inf inferences from body language. And those judgments can predict really meaningful life outcomes like who we hire or promote, um, who we ask out on a date. For example, uh, uh, Nalani Ambadi, a researcher at Tufts University, shows that when people watch 30 minute, uh, 30 second soundless clips of real physician patient interactions, their judgments of the physician's niceness predict whether or not that physician will be sued. So it doesn't have to do so much with whether or not that physician was incompetent, but do we like that person and how they interacted? Um, even more dramatic, Alex Todorov at Princeton has shown us that um, judgments of political candidates' faces in just one second predict 70% of U.S. Senate and gubernatorial race outcomes. And even, let's go digital, emoticons used well in online negotiations can lead you to claim more value from that negotiation. If you use them poorly, bad idea, right? So. So when we think of nonverbals, we think of how we judge others, how they judge us, and what the outcomes are. We tend to forget, though, the other audience that's influenced by our nonverbals, and that's ourselves. We are also influenced by our nonverbals, our thoughts and our feelings and our physiology. So what nonverbals am I talking about? I'm a social psychologist, I study prejudice, and I teach at a competitive business school. So it was inevitable that I would become interested in power dynamics. I became especially interested in nonverbal expressions of power and dominance. Um, and what are nonverbal expressions of power and dominance? Well, this is what they are. So in the animal kingdom, they are about expanding. So you make yourself big, you stretch out, you take up space, you're basically opening up. It's about opening up. And this is true across the animal kingdom. It's not just limited to primates and humans do the same thing. So they do this both when they, when they have power sort of chronically, and also when they're feeling powerful in the moment. And this one is especially interesting because it really shows us how universal and old these expressions of power are. This expression, which is known as pride, uh, Jessica Tracy has studied, she shows that people who are born with sight and people who are congenitally blind do this when they win at a physical competition. So when they cross the finish line and they've won, it doesn't matter if they've never seen anyone do it, they do this. So the arms up in the V, the chin is slightly lifted. What do we do when we feel powerless? We do exactly the opposite. We close up, we wrap ourselves up, we make ourselves small, we don't want to bump into the person next to us. So again, both animals and humans do the same thing. And this is what happens when you put together high and low power. So what we tend to do when it comes to power is that we complement the other's nonverbals. So if someone's being really powerful with us, we tend to make ourselves smaller. We don't mirror them, we do the opposite of them. So I'm watching this behavior in the classroom, and um, what do I notice? I notice that uh, MBA students really exhibit the full range of power nonverbal. So you have people who are like caricatures of alphas, like really come into the room, they get right into the middle of the room before class even starts, like they really want to occupy space. Um, when they sit down, they're sort of spread out, they raise their hands like this. Um, you have other people who are virtually collapsing when they come in. As soon as they come in, you see it. You see it on their faces and their bodies, and they sit in their chair and they make themselves tiny, and they, they go like this when they raise their hand. I notice a couple of things about this. One, you're not going to be surprised. It seems to be related to gender. So um, women are much more likely to do this kind of thing than men. Um, women feel chronically less powerful than men, so this is not surprising. Um, but the other thing I noticed is that it also seemed to be related to the extent to which the students were participating and how well they were participating. And this is really important in the MBA classroom because participation counts for half the grade. So business schools have been struggling with this gender grade gap. You get these equally qualified women and men coming in, 
and then you get these differences in grades, and it seems to be partly attributable to participation. So I started to wonder, you know, okay, so you have these people coming in like this, and they're participating. Is it possible that we could get people to fake it, and would it lead them to participate more? So my main collaborator, Dana Carney, who's at Berkeley, and I really wanted to know, can you fake it till you make it? Like, can you do this just for a little while and actually experience a behavioral outcome that makes you seem more powerful? So we know that our nonverbals govern how other people think and feel about us. There's a lot of evidence. But our question really was, do our nonverbals govern how we think and feel about ourselves? There's some evidence that they do. So, for example, um, when we, we smile when we feel happy, but also when we're forced to smile by holding a pen in our teeth like this, it makes us feel happy. So it goes both ways. When it comes to power, um, it also goes both ways. So when you, when you uh, feel powerful, you're more likely to do this, but it's also possible that um, when you, when you uh, pretend to be powerful, you are more likely to actually feel powerful. So the second question really was, you know, so we know that our minds change our bodies, but is it also true that, that our bodies change our minds? And when I say minds in the case of the powerful, what am I talking about? So I'm talking about thoughts and feelings and the sort of physiological things that make up our, our thoughts and feelings. And in my case, that's hormones. I look at hormones. So what do the minds of the powerful versus the powerless look like? So powerful people, tend to be, not surprisingly, more assertive and more confident, uh, more, more optimistic. They actually feel that they're going to win even at games of chance. Uh, they also tend to be able to think more abstractly. So there are a lot of differences. They take more risks. There are a lot of differences between powerful and powerless people. Physiologically, there also are differences. On two key hormones, testos testosterone, which is the dominant hormone, and cortisol, which is the stress hormone. So what we find is that um, uh, high power alpha males in primate hierarchies have high testosterone and low cortisol. And powerful and effective leaders also have high testosterone and low cortisol. So what does that mean? When you think about power, ten people tended to think only about testosterone because that was a, about dominance. But really power is also about how you react to stress. So do you want the high power leader that's dominant, high on testosterone, but really stress reactive? Probably not, right? You want the person who's powerful and assertive and dominant, but not very stress reactive, the person who's laid back. So we know that in, uh, in, in primate hierarchies, if an alpha needs to take over, uh, if, if an individual needs to take over an alpha role sort of suddenly, within a few days, that individual's testosterone has gone up significantly and his cortisol has dropped significantly. So we have this evidence, both that the body can shape the mind, at least at the facial level, um, and also that role changes can shape the mind. So what happens, okay, you take a role change, um, what happens if you do that at a really minimal level, like this tiny manipulation, this tiny intervention, for two minutes you say, I want you to stand like this and it's going to make you feel more powerful. So this is what we did. We decided to uh, bring people into the lab and run a little experiment. And these people adopted for two minutes either high power poses or low power poses. And I'm just going to show you five of the poses, although they took on only two. So here's one, a couple more. This one has been dubbed the Wonder Woman by the media. Here are a couple more. So you can be standing or you can be sitting. Uh, and here are the low power poses. So you're folding up, you're making yourself small. This one is very low power. When you're touching your neck, you're really kind of protecting yourself. So this is what happens. They come in, they spit into a vial. We, for two minutes, say, you need to do this or this. They don't look at pictures of the poses. We don't want to prime them with the concept of power. We want them to be feeling power, right? So two minutes they do this. We then ask them, how powerful do you feel on a series of items? And then we give them an opportunity to gamble. And then we take another saliva sample. That's it. That's the whole experiment. So this is what we find. Risk tolerance, which is the gambling. What we find is that when you're, not, when the, when you're in the high power pose condition, 86% of you will gamble. 
when you're in the low power pose condition, only 60%, and that's a pretty whopping significant difference. Here's what we find on testosterone. From their baseline when they come in, high power people experience about a 20% increase, and low power people experience about a 10% decrease. So again, two minutes and you get these changes. Here's what you get on cortisol. High power people experience about a 25% decrease, and the low power people experience about a 15% increase. So two minutes lead to these hormonal changes that configure your brain to basically be either assertive, confident, and comfortable, or really stress reactive, um, and you know, feeling sort of shut down. We've all had that feeling, right? So it seems that our nonverbals do govern how we think and feel about ourselves. So it's not just others, but it's also ourselves. Also, our bodies change our minds. But the next question, of course, is can power posing for a few minutes really change your life in meaningful ways? So this is in the lab. It's this little task. You know, it's just a couple of minutes. You know, where can you actually apply this, which we cared about, of course. And so we think it's really what, what, what matters I and mean, where you want to use this is evaluative situations, like social threat situations. Where are you being evaluated, either by your friends, like for teenagers at the lunchroom table. It could be, you know, for some people, it's speaking at a school board meeting. It might be giving a pitch or giving a talk like this or um, doing a job interview. We decided that the one that most people could relate to because most people had been through was the job interview. So um, we published these, these findings and the media are all over it and they say, um, okay, so this is what you do when you go in for the job interview, right? You know, so we were of course horrified and said, oh my God, no, 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 that's not what we meant at all for a new, numerous reasons. No, 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 don't do that. Again, this is not about you talking to other people, it's you talking to yourself. What do you do before you go into a job interview? You do this. Right? You're sitting down, you're looking at your iPhone or your Android, not trying to leave anyone out. Um, you are, you know, you're looking at your notes, you're hunching up, making yourself small, when really what you should be doing maybe is this, like in the bathroom, right? Do that, find two minutes. So that's what we want to test, okay? So we bring people into a lab and they do a couple, they do either high or low power poses again. They go through a very stressful job interview. It's five minutes long. They are being recorded, they're being judged also, and the judges are trained to give no nonverbal feedback. So they look like this, like imagine this is the person interviewing you. So for five minutes, nothing. And this is worse than being heckled. People hate this. It's, it's what Marianne LaFrance calls standing in social quicksand. So this really spikes your cortisol. So this is the job interview we put them through because we really wanted to see what happened. We then have these coders look at these tapes, four of them. They're blind to the hypothesis, they're blind to the conditions, they have no idea who's been posing in what pose. And they, they, they end up looking at these sets of tapes and they say, oh, we want to hire these people, all the high power posers, we don't want to hire these people. We also evaluate these people much more positively overall. But what's driving it? It's not about the content of the speech, it's about the presence that they're bringing to the speech. We also, because we rate them on all these variables related to sort of competence, like how well structured is the speech? How good is it? What are their qualifications? No effect on those things. This is what's affected, these kinds of things. People are bringing their true selves, basically. They're bringing themselves. They bring their ideas, but as themselves, with, with no you know, residue over them. So this is what's driving the effect or mediate, mediating the effect. So um, when I tell people about this, that our bodies change our minds and our minds can change our behavior and our behavior can change our outcomes, they say to me, I don't, it feels fake, right? So I said fake it till you make it. Like I don't, it's not me. Like I don't want to get there There's and then still feel like a fraud. Okay, I don't want to feel like an imposter. I don't want to get there yeah. only to feel like I'm not supposed to be here. And that really resonated with me because I want to tell you a little story about being an imposter and feeling like I'm not supposed to be here. When I was 19, I was in a really bad car accident. I was thrown out of a car, rolled several times. I was thrown from the car and um, I woke up in a head injury rehab ward and I had been withdrawn from college um, and I learned that my IQ had dropped by two standard deviations, which was um, 
tr very traumatic. I knew my IQ because I had identified with being smart, and I had been called gifted as a child. So I'm um, taken out of college. I keep trying to go back. They say you're not going to finish college. Like just you know, there's, there are other things for you to do, but that's not going to work out for you. So. I, I really struggled with this, and I have to say, having your identity taken from you, your core identity, and if, for me it was being smart, having that taken from you, there's nothing that leaves you feeling more powerless than that. So I felt entirely powerless. I worked and worked and worked, and I got lucky and worked and got lucky and worked. Eventually I graduated from college. It took me four years longer than my peers, and I convinced someone, my, my angel uh, advisor, Susan Fisk, to take me on. And so I ended up at Princeton, and I was like, I am not supposed to be here. I am an imposter. And the night before my first year talk, and the first year talk at Princeton is a 20-minute talk to 20 people. That's it. I was so afraid of being found out the next day that I called her and said, I'm quitting. She was like, you are not quitting because I took a gamble on you and you're staying. You're gonna stay and this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna fake it. You're gonna take, you're gonna do every talk that you ever get asked to do. You're just gonna do it and do it and do it even if you're terrified and just paralyzed and having an out of body experience until you have this moment where you say, oh my gosh, I'm doing it. Like I have become this. I am actually doing this. So that's what I did, five years in grad school. A few years, you know, I'm at Northwestern, I moved to Harvard. I'm at Harvard, I'm not really thinking about it anymore, but for a long time I had been thinking, not supposed to be here, not supposed to be here. So at the end of my first year at Harvard, um, a student who had not talked in class the entire semester, who I had said, look, you've got to participate or else you're going to fail, came into my office. I really didn't know her at all. And she said, she came in totally defeated and she said, I'm not supposed to be here. And that was the moment for me because two things happened. One was that I realized, oh my gosh, I don't feel like that anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't feel that anymore, but she does and I get that feeling. And the second was, she is supposed to be here. Like she can fake it, she can become it. So I was like, yes, you are. You are supposed to be here and tomorrow you're gonna fake it. You're gonna make yourself powerful. And you know, you're gonna... <laughs> You're gonna go. You're gonna go into the classroom, and you are gonna give the best comment ever. You know, and she gave the best comment ever. And people turned around. They're like, "Oh my God! I didn't even notice her sitting there." You know. She comes back to me months later, and I realized that she had not just faked it till she made it. She had actually faked it till she became it. So she had changed. Um, and so I, I, I want to say to you: Don't fake it till you make it. Fake it till you become it. You know, it's not do it enough until you actually become it and internalize. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is this. Tiny tweaks can lead to big changes. So this is two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Before you go into the next stressful evaluative situation, for two minutes, try doing this in the elevator, in a bathroom stall, at your desk behind closed doors. That's what you want to do. Get Configure your brain to cope the best in that situation. Get your testosterone up. Get your cortisol down. Don't leave that situation feeling like, oh, I didn't show them who I am. Leave that situation feeling like, oh, I really feel like I got to say who I am and show who I am. So I want to ask you first, you know, both to try power posing and also I want to ask you to share this science because this is simple. I don't have ego involved in this. Give it away. Like share it with people because the people who can use it the most are the ones with no resources and no technology and no status and no power. Give it to them because they can do it in private. They need their bodies, privacy, and two minutes and it can significantly change the outcomes of their life. Thank you.
See it up? All right, on to the video pun. That's so powerful. You don't even have to see it. That's what makes body language so important because yeah. it's so instinctual. It's yep. it's not. You don't even think about. It. Like if somebody says something that surprises you, you don't think to yourself, "Hmm, let me furrow my eyebrows. <laughs> let me fix my lips." It just happens to you. You don't need any, any. Nothing tells you. Babies learn body language from parents and people they interact, and it just follows us throughout life. So, because we have visually impaired students here at the school, and we have visually impaired instructors at the school, such as myself, I we put this portion in, and it's not just for the visually impaired, but and if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. But from the perspective of people who are visually impaired or blind, body language is very, very difficult. And the one thing she said is, we fake it until we make it. If you can't see a person's eyes, you just look straight where their voice is coming from. You sit up straight and tall, and it's really, you are faking it. I used to work for the federal government, and I used to be so terrified of this one manager. Every time I went in her office, uh, they called it, called the meeting, I went to her office, my girlfriend would say, why are you, um, why are you scared? You look all timid, intimidated, and I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder how she knew that. But I had my arms crossed, and I'm all nervous, and my legs are moving, and I, I said, well, I guess I do look a little scared. So I practiced like, all right, I know she's, I know that she's a very strong personality, and I'm not gonna let her know by my body language that I'm intimidated by her. So I start, I sat up straight, and she talked, I made sure I look straight ahead. Again, as a visually impaired or blind person, it's a little difficult, but I look straight ahead. And it helped me because I still felt the same way inside, but she wasn't gonna know it. <laughs> so, and in interviews, it's even more importantly, when from a person who's, who's blind, when somebody, you have to shake someone's hand and at the end of an interview or beginning, you extend your hand because no one is gonna reach out and grab your hand. That is just not going to happen. So because we can't see, you just know that when you meet Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones, you put your hand out to them, and then that makes the person who you're dealing with feel more comfortable. So body language is very important, and it, it, it starts from a very early age. And that's it's, it's amazing how instinctual it is, but we really have to work at it, um, those of us who are blind. Now, do you all have any questions for me? Any questions? Yes, I, I do. Certainly. What if you do put your hands out to extend for a handshake and they say to you, oh, I'm sorry, I, let me apologize now. I do not shake hands. I had someone do that. Uh -huh. you know, isn't that strange? But I take my hands out <laughs> and I say, okay. And you know what I do? I smile. Give them a warm smile. Because some people are, in this day and age, really, people are afraid of germs. People yeah. don't like to be touched. People don't like to be, you know. So it's their personal preference. So at that point, you're going to show them that you're flexible. And before you know it, you'll take your hand back. And I promise you, you'll say, oh, okay. And you'll smile. Because that's the only other option you have, you know. So the, and, you, and your body will know what to do. You'll pull your hand back. And you'll be like, okay. That's it. That's that's all you can do with that person. Because you... I, I've run into someone like that. I mean, short of Howie Mandel with the gloves on, you know, you don't want to shake your hands. You, you might run into someone like that. You might. You think you stand six feet away from them. Yeah, some people don't want to even get close. Now, that's a really difficult one because, like, from where you're standing and somebody says, oh, good to meet you, that's a little difficult, but you just give it back to them. Okay, nice to meet you, too. From across the, I mean, if that's the way it's going to be, you just still have to look in that person's direction or pretend you're looking and give them what, you know, from from where, like, where Sion's standing to me. That's not a, an intimate uh, relationship or an intimate interview, but some people are just like that. So just we have like to be that. prepared to deal with people who are like that. Are there any other questions? What if they speak low? That's difficult too. Some people have very low voices, and all I can tell, and you know, it's funny because we were talking, I did this on um, before and some some blind people have the 
instinct to when someone's talking, they turn their ear to the person. Well, because when you're listening to something and you're not looking at it, it makes sense that you turn your ear to the person's voice. It's like listening to a radio. Right. You can't do that, though. Even if they're speaking low, you, you just have to still look at them and say, you, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty understanding you. Um, could you just speak up a little bit? I mean, they might not, their, their natural speaking voice may be of a low tone or a low pitch, but you can't, and I, I mean, that's, outside of people don't do that probably, but blind people do. You turn your ear to the person's voice, and you can't do that. You just, you just can't. This <laughs> is bad, bad business. So. Well, is it acceptable, I mean, because the person's blind? No. It's not? Okay. You know why? Because in the real world, we fit into the sighted world. The sighted world does not fit into the blind world. Okay. Just no way. And even if you see, please, if, if you guys see one of us do something like that, if you feel comfortable, say, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. And so the person, because everybody needs practice, so, so, so you can make sure. If I wasn't looking in your direction, I was listening to your voice, I, don't, I want you to say, I'm right here. All right. So the person will know. They might not know. They might not know they do that. But we're preparing you for the workplace, and that's not good etiquette for body language. All right. Anything else? Thank okay. you for those copious notes. Copious notes. I like that word. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, one more question. Yes. yes. You mentioned the word good etiquette in the workplace. Yes. This is Oh, say if um, someone, you know, you cover that, mm -hmm. you know, you fast forward today, and you're speaking to different colleagues and mm -hmm. different hierarchies, and they don't speak, they see you or recognize, but they do not. After you said good morning or hello, they refuse to open your mouth, their mouth to you. And it's been going on, you know, maybe six or seven months. What do you do? And you said you work at work etiquette. Etiquette mm -hmm. in the business professional atmosphere. Okay. Well, I know you deal with it. I, I, yeah, you do, you know, that, that's, now, when you, as far as etiquette goes, there's a lot of factors in that. Some people think that managers are so busy, they don't speak sometimes. They are not, they might see you, but they don't speak because they have things on their mind, so they don't speak. Is it right? No. But they do. Employees who are just, do they do, they do. Yeah. Some, some employees just are the type of people, your colleagues, they won't speak. They just. It's not that they don't see you. You're absolutely right, but they don't speak. So here are your choices, etiquette-wise. You can continue to speak to them and just say hi. And just maybe one day, by some osmosis, they'll change. Or you can just <laughs> smile and acknowledge them and keep going. But you want to be cordial, at least. And if you don't feel comfortable speaking, I would never say, just keep speaking to a person who doesn't speak. But, I mean... Sometimes you might want to be like, okay, maybe I can help this person change. Hi. I wouldn't help hold a conversation with somebody who doesn't talk to me, but I might say hi and wave. Or you can smile. But it's up to you. But I would never say meet that person's level of nonverbal with the same nonverbal. I would never suggest that. Because now you're coming down to right. their level. Right. So yeah. I would never I would never suggest you do that. Mm -hmm. So it's either you say hi, you continue to be who you are. Right. And, and, and display your pleasant, cordial personality in verbal or in nonverbal, which will be a smile and keep it moving. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Cass. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> what did you guys think of the video otherwise? Great. It was a little long winded. Um, but I think that there are some really important points that she made, right? I thought, <coughs> of course, this is my favorite. I read it on the board. Now, don't just fake it till you make it. Fake it till you become it. I wrote that down. So I think that was a great point because a lot of us, especially when we start out in a job, we don't know what we're getting ourselves into. We're nervous. We don't know what we're doing. The best advice, really, is to fake it till you make it. To fake it, you know, like act like you know what's going on. Of course, ask questions, but you don't want to have that dazed look like, oh, what's, what's going on? You want to seem confident. And having that confidence is so attractive. I know that, you know, when 
you're listing some desirable traits that you want in a partner, confidence is something that's really important to most people. So you want to, likewise, you want to be confident in yourself, in your ability, you know, to do the jobs, and you want to fake it till you make it, and then, of course, like she said, fake it till you become it. I think once you start faking it till you make it, faking it, getting used to it, you're going to be surprised by what's happened. Okay? So, thank you guys for all watching the video. We're going to get give some time for you to get started on homework. So, the homework is through chapters 10 and 4. Then we're going to do some practice of tongue twisters, breathing exercises, uh, we're going to look up fear fighting in our workbook. I want you guys to all just write a few sentences of an example of an active listening experience that you had for next class. So does everyone know what active listening means? Is it in our book? Barbara, what's active listening? I think it's when you participate not only in the conversation. Right. talking and listening, but you're actually following through with what's going on in the conversation. Not just appearing to sort of say yes, yes, yes. But actually look, because there's a difference between listening and really listening. Exactly. There's a difference. Hearing. I guess we could say listening we can hear and hearing. And right. Hear That's, and listen. That's true. Those are two yeah. different things. So yeah. hearing is a name. Listening is something that you have, you have to learn, like we yes. talked about earlier. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. Sometimes people will listen and don't hear. Good. Okay. Or, or yeah. They'll hear you. I, I I used to have a teacher that that would say to the class, "You hear me, but you're not listening." Listen they would to say class. just like that, and just their inflection of the word "listening" made them perk their ears up, and they would ask, "Well, why do you think we're not listening? Because you're not even engaging in the conversation." Or why am I talking if you're not engaging in the conversation? That's what active listening is. And I know sometimes you have a conversation and you're trying to talk to somebody and you don't even get through your sentence. And yeah. they're already right. on you like, I don't even think they heard half my sentence. Right. right. Yep. Marcella, listen to grasp the idea of what you're saying, baby. What's that? To grasp the idea of what you're saying. Grasp the idea of what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you want to make sure yep. the person's actively yeah. involved. Mm -hmm. If you turn to 136 in your book, um, it's just the definition I'm going to read. As the name implies, active listening is a communication tool that requires the listener to actively participate in an interaction. When a listener focuses full attention on a speaker and vice versa, real understanding begins to grow, relationships improve, and people feel valued. Make a commitment to understanding and get involved in the listening process. Okay. So that was page 136 in the gray box. For homework, so you're going to read chapters 10 and 4. I want everyone to come up with a, an example of active, of an active listening experience that they've had in their life. Okay? And then we'll do some sharing. So everyone email me their persuasive essay from today. Right? Okay, so if you haven't done that, Please do that now. And we have 10 minutes in class left, so we can get started on reading chapters 10 and 4. And then in the next class, we're going to go over those tongue twisters, the breathing exercises, and the fear fed fighting techniques that are in your workbook. So for homework, don't worry about that. Just worry about reading chapters 10 and 4 and preparing a quick example of an active listening. There's Write it down because I'm going to ask you to email it to us again. Up. And there's a method to the way these chapters are set up, so it might seem like you're bouncing from one chapter to the next, but chapter 10 leads you into what's going on in chapter 4. You know, whoever, when they created the textbook, they created the textbook in a linear fashion, but in reality, things don't happen the way the textbooks say it in that, or, in that order that the textbook has it. So what we did was we reorganized it in a fashion that it actually happens. Um, I just wanted to make one announcement before uh, before we leave for today. This Friday, 
I have a typing lab. Yep. And I would love to see all of you there, if possible. Um, I understand everyone has different scheduling conflicts and whatever have you, but is if you want to improve on your typing accuracy and speed, I, I think it would behoove you to show up on Fridays in, to our typing lab. I have a few students here who actually do show up, like Miss Dorothea and Miss Karen. And what time did you say? Sir? It's in and, and Miss Vernita. Uh, I have it from uh, about 10, 10 o'clock to about two thirty to three, and uh, we start off with some practice on either typing web or typingtraining.com or I can also give you uh, a copy of the drills that we may do or may not do because I like to mix it up. Um, there are different exercises that I use to get you to think differently about how you type. 